I would like to just welcome folks again and uh, welcome our our two speakers, um, um, uh, Dr. Munir John Mohammed um, uh, from Sacramento. So he's down the road from us in the Bay Area. Um, uh, is a heart failure specialist with Mercy Medical Group in Sacramento, California. He specializes in advanced heart failure, left ventricular assist devices, critical care medicine, pulmonary hypertension, and digital health. He's the current director, medical director for Mercy uh, General Heart Failure and Circulatory System Program. Uh, he trained um, uh, as an intern and resident at LSU, uh, then off to USC for a heart failure fellowship and research uh, and a nuclear medicine fellowship, uh, followed by UCSF Fred um, Fresno um, in general cardiologist, and then UCSF San Francisco in transplant cardiologist. So sort of one of your average folks, not very well trained. Oops, sorry, uh, very well trained. Uh, so we're very happy to have you. It's incredible. Um, and, and then uh, Dr. Nesar Faluzi, who's uh, joined us today, he leads the cardiovascular service line for Common Spirit Health. And uh, we've gotten to be friends and colleagues over the last uh, several months. Uh, he's, he's just been a, a great partner um, uh, for all of the persons at Common Spirit Health. So he is the system um, vice president of um, the cardio of uh, the Common Spirit Health Cardiovascular Service Line. He's an interventional cardiologist who practices in Lexington, Kentucky, and specializes in structural coronary and peripheral vascular interventions. Uh, he's part of the CHI St. Joseph Cardiology uh, Group and a founding board member of the CHI St. Joseph Medical Group. Um, and he's their medical director for the Structural Heart Program. Um, uh, he uh, trained at, uh, in internal medicine at Robert Wood Johnson's Hospital in New Brunswick, uh, followed by an, um, um, uh, um, an interventional fellowship at the University of Kentucky. He has a master's in public health from Rutgers, and he's finishing his uh, MBA in his spare time. So uh, we thank both of you, and um, we're going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Jean Mohammed, and we'll get started. Okay, great. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you, Dr. Griswick, for that uh, uh, kind introduction and obviously the invitation to speak. In addition, I'd like to thank Dr. Faluji for the invitation and his uh, leadership and constant support of the cardiovascular service line. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm a heart failure specialist. I'm very passionate about what I do. And I hopefully after this talk, uh, 20 minutes, uh, you feel the same passion that I do. So what's new in heart failure? So this is actually a perfect timing for this talk, actually, because in the last week, there's two new FDA uh, approvals, which have going to make hopefully a big impact in the care of our patients. So what, what are our learning objectives? So first of all, we're going to talk about what's the new definition of heart failure. This came out last year. We're going to talk about what's new with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction uh, or HEFPEF, sometimes we call it, some people call it diastolic heart failure what's new in HEFREF, systolic heart failure, reduced ejection fraction. And then also there was a new consensus document that came out last year. We're gonna talk about just five kind of key points uh, we should remember. So I think we obviously know this, we deal with this on a daily basis. The prevalence of heart failure is increasing. Uh, the age of our population is also increasing as well too. And this caused a quite a high uh, symptom burden, right? The Kansas City questionnaire is a questionnaire uh, to give a sense of how, uh, uh, burdensome is the condition to the patient's the quality of life. And you can see it's a quite a high score. And mortality, unfortunately, remains quite high, approximately about 40% at five years. And as we know, this is a huge uh, uh, burden on the healthcare system. So how can we make an impact on reducing heart failure hospitalization and survival? So what's the new definition of HEFREF, right? So, sorry, for heart failure. So I think when you first see a patient with heart failure, you gotta figure out what type of heart failure do they have, right? And then it goes by the ejection fraction, right? So HEFREF is ejection fraction less than 40%. If HEFPEF is ejection fraction above 50%, and then they have this group called heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, which is 40 to 50. And these patients actually behave more like someone with uh, a patient with a lower ejection fraction. So we kind of treat them as such. And now, since these new therapies have come out, we actually have patients that actually recover their heart function. So now there's a term heart failure with improved ejection fraction, which means you start at less than 40% and it goes up by 10 points and greater than 40, right? So this, so first, when you see a patient, it's important that you take a moment, you identify what type of heart failure am I treating, because then you can figure out the specific therapies. All right, so HEFPEP, right? 50% of patients that we take care of in practice, diastolic heart failure is HEFPEP. It's a very difficult condition to treat, as we know, right? These patients tend to be older, 
they have other comorbidities, COPD, hypertension, AFib, more common in women. And, but we do know there are some treatments that we can do, simple treatments, right? Controlling blood pressure, that's a simple thing we can do, can make a big impact. Uh, they're often on diuretics as well too. And then we, often, oftentimes they have arrhythmias as well too, atrial fibrillation. So they may need antiarrhythmics or sometimes even uh, ablation as well too. So this is a little summary of uh, where we've come in HEFPEF, right? So uh, prior to 2017, there was multiple clinical studies in HEFPEF looking at beta blockers, ARBs, DIG, uh, and none of the studies were positive. They're all neutral. So we were doing the same thing before 2017, blood pressure, diuretics, and then arrhythmias. And then 2014, uh, a study called the Champion study looked at a sensor called a cardiomem sensor, which is implanted inside the, the left pulmonary artery, goes inside the, inside the, the pulmonary artery, and it's able to, able to gather hemodynamics to see how congested the patient is. So patients at home, they lay on a pillow, we're able to obtain what their PAD is, which is a surrogate of their wedge pressure and adjust their diabetics remotely. So that was approved in 2014 uh, based on the Champion study for both HEFREF and HEFPEF, functional class three, and patients who've been hospitalized in the last year. Now, many of us know that some patients have not been hospitalized in the last year. Let's say, for instance, during COVID, right? They were scared to come to the hospital, but they have significant heart failure. Don't you think these patients may benefit from remote monitoring of sensors? There was a set study that I was part of the sites, including some other sites as well, too, called a guide HF, looking at, can we look at expanded indications for the sensor? And I, I'm happy to hear uh, announce that on Tuesday, the FDA has approved an expanded indication for this sensor for both HEFPEF and HEFREF, functional class two, before it was only three, so two and three, and either hospitalization or elevated biomarkers, such as a BNP or NT pro BNP. There was another study called the TopCat study, which when I was a fellow, I was participating as well too, uh, using, use, using the use of a medication called spironolactone, an old drug, a great drug that's really underutilized as concerns of hyperkalemia, which is really not that common. And the study was actually neutral, but if you look at the study and look at the patients that were in the United States versus let's say overseas, uh, patients actually did better. So based on that, a lot of us in the heart rate community have been using spironolactone uh, because of clinical benefit. It can, it's great for controlling blood pressure as well too. And as such, the guidelines were updated in 2017, including spironolactone as a, you can consider for HEFPEF class 2A. And then for the first time ever, the first positive trial was announced late last year at, at the uh, AHA, uh, sorry, at, yeah, I think at the AHA called the Emperor Preserve using a medication called empofloxacin, which many of you on here may know about this STL2 inhibitor showing clinical benefit. And I'm happy to announce just yesterday, the FDA has approved this now for HEFPEF. So now we have the first approved therapy for HEFPEF. So how do I approach these patients? So like I said, control blood pressure. Don't forget that's a simple thing to do. A lot of these patients have underdiagnosed CAD, so make sure you kind of consider risk factors and do appropriate testing. Assess for any type of arrhythmias. Give diuretics as needed. I use a lot of spironolactone as long as their potassium creatinine is okay. And then uh, just based on, like, like I said, I've been using for the last couple of months based on the Ampo Preserve study, but now we can use Ampofloxacin or Jardines for HEFPEF. And then sometimes you can consider Cardiomems. All right, what about HEFREF, which is systolic heart failure? Next slide. Okay, anyone knows me, I'm a crazy uh, a sports fan. So why am I so enthusiastic about my 49ers and also you know, uh, HEFREF therapies, right? Next slide. So where have we come, right? So a lot of us know some of these therapies, right? Uh, we've come a long way, the management of systolic heart failure, right? Some of us may remember back in the day, all we had was simple therapies such as diuretics and digoxin in the early 80s. And then we, we learned the mechanism of heart failure, right? You have overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system and then the RAS system, right? So we target those therapies, right? With beta blockers, ACE, ARBs, spironolactone and plerinone, MRAs, which is aldosterone antagonist, and then isosorbohydralzine. And then obviously in the 2000s, we had devices such as CRT, which is a chronic resynchronization therapy, and then LVAD therapies for end stage heart failure. And kind of, we were kind of in a low. We had the same theme therapies we had for many years. And I've been practicing for heart failure, I can't believe for 10 years now. I feel old now, you know, but I remember early when I was practicing at UCSF, you know, we were using these same therapies, ACE, beta blockers, and, you know, we were making some dent, but patients, unfortunately, were still coming to the hospital and this, unfortunately, they were still dying. In the last 15 years, we've had two novel pathways that are really exciting, and, and hopefully I'm going to talk about them. Arnie's, which is Entresta, Sucubitol, Valsartan, was approved in 2016, and then a really exciting class of drug, the STL2 inhibitors, were recently published in 2019. We're going to talk about those. Next slide. 
So let's talk about Arni, Sucubitril, uh, or Entresto. It's really an interesting and a very nice mechanism. So we know that on the right side, you can see the RAS system, right? The RAS system is what we've been blocking with ACE and ARBs, right? And we know the RAS system, when it gets activated, it causes vasoconstriction, fibrosis, since we're trying to avoid, and those are harmful and heart failure patients, right? So for many years, we've been blocking that pathway. But our own body has a uh, counter-regulatory pathway called the netratic peptide system, which actually promotes positive remodeling, decreased blood pressure, decreased fibrosis. So what if we're able to block the bad pathway and promote the good pathway? And that's what sucubitril valsartan is. Valsartan, we know, is an ARB, so you're blocking the right, the ARB, so you're blocking the harmful effects, and sucubitril prevents the breakdown of natriuretic peptides. So what do you have? A net balance shifting towards the natriuretic peptides. And that's why these patients, you notice they, not, they have a lot of, uh, they pee quite a bit, right, when you start the medication, because this has some natriuresis. So that's the mechanism of sucubitril, valsartan, or entresta. And then this was studying the Paradigm study, which was published in 2014. And this was looking at uh, sucubitril, valsartan, and tresto compared to enalapril. Enalapril is the gold horse, uh, working horse we've been having for many years, right? And this showed a 20% 20, 20 relative risk reduction for cardiovascular death and hospitalization over enalapril. Pretty amazing, right? Against the gold standard. And then an interesting has been happening more recently. So when many of us have been starting these patients on sucubitril, valsartan, we saw a drop in NT pro BMP, which you're seeing here on the slide. You can see start the medication, you see a drop in NT pro BMP pretty rapidly, and it kind of slows down after three months. Next slide. And look what's happening here. On the left here, ejection fraction is improving, reverse remodeling, right? EF is going up, and the LV dimensions is going down. What happens when you have heart failure with systolic heart failure? Your LV dilates and it gets reduced in function, right? And we're now seeing that for the first time, a, a medication that causes can, can cause sometimes reverse remodeling, improvement of ejection fraction, decreased LV size. And many of us are seeing these heart success stories much more commonly now since we have this therapy. Another interesting class of drugs, something called STL2 inhibitors. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but however, we know that these were uh, therapies originally developed for diabetics about 10 years ago. We know a lot of diabetics obviously have cardiovascular disease. So the FDA said that for any new diabetic drugs, we need to make sure they're safe cardiovascularly wise. So they were looking for any signals. And they found that interesting when patients were treated with this medication that had heart failure, they actually did better. So they did do two studies in HEFREP, Emperor Preserve, and uh, sorry, Emperor Reduced, and DAPA as well too, showing a clinical benefit uh, of the primary endpoint, which was worsening heart failure, cardiovascular death, and an Emperor uh, was heart failure hospitalization, cardiovascular death, about 25%. The mechanism is not exactly known, but these are not really diabetic drugs. These are cardiovascular drugs. In this study, 50% had diabetes, 50% did not have diabetes. So the ownership to prescribe these therapies is not our endocrinologist. It's not the primary. It's all of us, right? Including myself. These are, we need to change the notion these are diabetic drugs. These are cardiovascular drugs. And I didn't mention here, but for the sake of time, these are also renal protective drugs as well too. So really an amazing class of drugs. All right, so what's some five points that I want you to take away from the updated consensus document that was published late last year, and the guideline should come out relatively soon too. Number one, ARNIs or Entresta, Sucubitol Valsarta is now preferred, right? So when you see a patient with nuanced heart failure, if you can, ARNIs are preferred. Now, you can use ACE and ARBs. Don't get me wrong, they're great medications, but now they're saying that ARNIs, based on the data from the paradigm study showing the superiority to enalapril, should be our first-line therapy, point number one. Number two, before we had three pat three drugs, right? ACE, ARBs, beta blockers, MRAs. Fourth one, right? The STL2 inhibitors, right? So when a patient has a GFR above 30, you need to start this for type, uh, sorry, for non-type one diabetics with and without diabetes. What about mitral regurgitation? This is Dr. Fluji deals with all the time. So we know that when patients have heart failure and have secondary MR or what's called functional MR, the survival goes down. What happens? We talked in heart failure. The LV dilates, right? When the LV dilates, the leaflets and the mitral valve, they can't co op they can't come together, right? And you have this mitral regurgitation. It's a function of the ventricle being very sick, right? It's almost called like the A1C of the ventricle, right? It gives you an idea. The worse the MR, the worse the outcomes. And for many years, we thought that you should not try to fix this because if you try to fix it, it may make the heart failure get worse. And then we had a study called a co op study using a device called a mitral clip. This is a device which is percutaneously placed through the groin. And basically the concept, as you can see on the left, a clip is placed and basically clips the two leaflets together. 
you know, but that's a major problem is the co-op, right? So you bring the two leaflets together, reducing the mitral regurgitation. And you can see on the right here, on the left, you see a patient with leaky valve mitral regurgitation, and you can see the clip place as well too. And this was actually a study, point number three, that was published at TCT, which is a conference for interventional cardiologists, got a standing ovation for heart failure therapy. I mean, heart, uh, interventional cardiologists, uh, usually it's, takes heart, it's a hard crowd to please, but they stood up, they had a standing ovation for this, 50% reduction of heart failure hospitalization. This is amazing, right, of the therapy. And then a 38% reduction uh, in death from any cause. I don't know, Dr. Blue, you want to say anything, but I think it was a really widely accepted as a groundbreaking therapy and really a lot, a lot of excitement, not only in the heart failure space, but the interventional space. Yeah, this, this, this was the first time we've ever had that standing innovation from our colleagues in heart failure, so we're yeah. happy. <laughs> right, yeah. Probably the last one, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, the four, point number four, right? Uh, we're seeing now patients improve their heart function, right? So let's say you see a patient in your office that ejection fraction is 25%. I just saw one yesterday, went from 25, now he's at 50 to 55, right? What should we do? Should we back off of therapies? And this was a small study called a trade hf study, looking at what happens when patients normalize to their heart failure when you back off on the medications and it showed patients develop worsening heart failure. So if your ejection fraction is above 40% with GDMT, guideline directed medical therapy, without any type of reversible cause, then they recommend to continue the medical therapy. So that's some advice you give to the patients. And that's been in the consensus document too. Now, very important point too, right? We know that heart failure unfortunately is a progressive disease, right? Despite all this excitement I'm talking about, we still don't have a cure for heart failure, right? And so when should we recognize when patients are advancing to advanced heart failure where they need therapy such as an elevator or heart transplant? And we have this simple mnemonic that we've been kind of using for the last couple of years, I need help, right? When should you refer a patient to a heart failure specialist? So number one, inotropes. Any patient that's on inotropes, that's a poor sign. That suggests the heart as a pump is abnormal. If you remember when patients are diagnosed with heart failure, what do they mostly present with? Shortness of breath, right? If it's a congestion issue. When patients have end-stage heart failure, it becomes a pump issue. So what do they present with? It's very different. They say, doc, I just feel tired all the time. I can't concentrate. You're getting no blood flow to the brain. I can't, I don't have an appetite, no blood flow to the gut. So it becomes a perfusion issue, right? So that's why if you're on inotropes, that suggests the output is low. Anyone that's having worsening functional class, right? Pretty almost like resting symptoms, functional class four. And organ dysfunction, a patient you've been seeing in your office for many years, now they're having rising creatinine, LTs, and organ dysfunction. E, very low ejection fraction, shocks mid defibrillator. Is that because the substrate, the ventricle is failing? More than one heart failure hospitalization in the compliant patient. Now, I practice in Sacramento. Unfortunately, we have a lot of methamphetamine here. So I'm not talking about a patient that's not taking their meds and doing drugs. I'm talking about a patient that's taking all the therapies and they're still getting me to the hospital. That's a poor sign. And we know that every hospitalization, your survival goes down. We have failed that patient. Uh, and we need to do something differently to change your trajectory. Other, unfortunately, they will die in the future. Edema, despite escalating diuretic, patient that's say you've been on Bumex one milligram twice a day, now you're having going to two milligrams because again, perfusion is decreased to the kidneys, you need higher dose of diuretics. Low blood pressure, heart rate, that's always a scary combination. Patient comes to the hospital, blood pressure in the 90s, heart rate in the one teens, that suggests the output is low. And then a patient, let's say you've been seeing your practice for many years, that now you're having to back off all the GDMT, right? Because now actually, remember those neurohormones we talked about that are harmful in the heart? At end-stage heart failure, they're helpful. Remember, these are fight or flight hormones. So actually, when you put these patients on, let's say, in Tresto or ACE or ARBs, it blocks these neurohormones and the patients develop hypotension. That's a poor prognostic sign. So I need help. Remember that. If you can't remember all of them, just remember one of them. I would probably say one hospitalization or more, you should consider the patient may be in trouble. I'm not going to go over all this. This is actually talk about when should you refer to a heart failure specialist? I think the threshold is very low. You should refer anyone to a heart failure specialist if it has heart failure, to be quite honest. This is alongside looking at nuance of heart failure, I need help, persistent symptoms. But I really think that, you know, depending on where you practice, um, I think that we're kind of in tune with all these different therapies and we can work with the primary cardiologist or, or the primary care physician to ensure that on all the appropriate therapies that they have which I'm gonna talk about in the next few slides. And I'm really a big proponent of telehealth, right? So we know during COVID, we kind of pivoted to telehealth. And I think it's unfortunately, it's kind of a blessing in disguise, right? Uh, and we're kind of medicine moving towards a patient-centered care approach, right? We're seeing patients coming from long distances, right? Think about when you go see a doctor, you need to spend maybe an hour to get there. You gotta look for parking, you got your appointment. I mean, we're talking about a couple hours, right? 
can telemedicine help kind of help bridge that gap, right? And not necessarily replace office visits, but to complement office visits, right? So there was a segment of focus on heart failure, MySpace, right? So there was a study in Jack last year showing the feasibility during COVID of managing patients with heart failure with remote monitoring, either telemedicine visit or phone visits, showing that these patients did just as well as other patients do traditional office visits. So what are my current applications of using uh, telemedicine or video visits? Well, assisting with quad therapy. We talked about starting these therapies, but you have to titrate up the medications, right? If I want to titrate up a medication, do I need them to spend two, three hours of their day to come every two to three weeks to come for an appointment? I saw a patient yesterday, she was at work, she was during lunch break, I did an office visit with her, we're able to ask what her blood pressure is, I had her labs and we're able to increase her medication. So again, she was able to continue with her day and I was able to achieve my goal of, of titrating the medications. Again, these are consistent with patient-centered care, right? And patients like telemedicine, so I think hopefully it's here to stay. So what are some potential options, right, uh, opportunities? Well, we do know that like, Unfortunately, advanced heart care specialists are not in every city, and many of the people on this call don't maybe have one in their town. However, they may have someone in their state, right? And, um, and some of the reasons that I get when I talk to referring doctors and I hear why they're not referring to, let's say, other programs, myself in Sacramento, is that patients sometimes don't want to drive, right? So what if you're able to offer them an opportunity to do a telemedicine visit? You're able to identify patients that may be in trouble, and I can say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. so-and-so, I'm a little concerned about your hospitalizations. I think maybe you need to come down to Sacramento. We need to talk more about maybe need more options, right? So I'm really hoping that's the next frontier telemedicine and other spaces as well too. Tower, for instance, people in the community, they get an echo and they have, let's say, severe air stenosis. They're able to see Dr. Faluji remotely and they're able to, you know, he can review all the data and just bring them in for the procedure, right? So I think hopefully that's the next frontier of this therapies. So this is actually a study that just came out last month, actually. And basically you can see on the left of the slide shows improvement in survival showing different combination medications for the treatment of HEFREF, right? And at the bottom, looking at medications such as ARBs alone or ACE inhibitors, you can see the greatest benefit for patients using a combination of ARNIs, which is Entresto, beta blockers, MRAs, and SGL2 inhibitors. That's the best chance for success. And the last part of the bottom says greatest chance for heart success. We need to stop using these terms heart failure. Let's talk about heart success with all these therapies is with quad therapy. Don't delay, initiate therapies early. And unfortunately, we're not doing a very good job as a community, right? Cardiologists, internists, everyone, right? Uh, this is a, from the CHAMP registry. Only 1% of patients are on target dose of GDMT, right? So we need to change this and increase this inertia. And uh, because these are life-saving therapies uh, for these patients. And the most common reason for not um, initiating these therapies were kidney dysfunction, hypotension, and that's all relative too, right? I tell my patients the first time I see them, when their heart function is 20%, their heart is never gonna generate a blood pressure of 120, 130. That's probably hypertensive for them, right? Their pump is not pumping like it's said. So the blood pressure would be in the 90s, it's just a number, right? And so it's important that they understand why they're on these, these medications as well too. So again, big sports fan. I'm also doing a lot of stuff on social media. This is actually uh, on my Instagram page. Uh, you know, last year, uh, and just actually just uh, two weeks ago, there was Heart Fair Awareness Week. I did this post. I did one this year as well, too. But last year, I talked about the GOATs, right? And I think for the most part, I'm a 49er fan. I'm a diehard Laker fan, but I give Brady credit. I give Jordan credit. Uh, some people may debate the four GOATs in sports, but there's no debating who the best therapies we have for HEFRA, ARNIs, beta blockers, MRA, and SGL2 inhibitors. Strive for greatness for our patients, quad therapy for all. So this is an important point, really. We can talk all you want, but how are we able to implement these therapies, right? These are kind of some tips that I do, right? It's important you take the time to talk to your patients what the goals are, right? So I tell my patients, why am I starting all these four therapies? I say these four therapies have been shown to make you feel better, stay at the hospital, improve survival, and may improve your heart function. So they understand, okay, well, maybe I should but remember, there's four therapies for heart failure. They may have coronary disease and other medications. We're talking about a lot of pills, right? Is that really polypharmacy? No, that's not polypharmacy because these therapies have been shown to additively on improve survival. Empower patients to understand why they're on quad therapy, right? Take that time, right? It once you take that time, it definitely improves compliance. Below is an educational tool that we, we use over at Mercy General uh, at the Dignity Health. Uh, I'm happy to share it. It shows the four pillars, right? On the orange is ARNIs, and then the blue is beta blockers, and then green, I guess, is uh, MRAs, and then the, I guess, turquoise is SGL2 inhibitors. 
we give this patient, we give these sheets to our patient, have them circle and bring to the appointments to see their progression, right? And then obviously, these could are expensive therapies. I haven't talked about that, but know your resources. There are resources for patients. And I push the different companies. You can push all these products all you want, but you have to provide the support for our patients, right? So know the resources for our patients. So this is my dad's old doctor bag. I'm just wrapping up here. Um, you know, what tricks did he have, right? So he's retired, been about 10 years. Uh, he was using ACE, ARBs, beta blockers, MRAs, and diuretics. And that was good therapies that we have. But what therapies do we have now in 2022? Next slide. Look at all the therapies we have. Not heart failure, heart success, right? What success do we have, right? Again, the post from Heart Fair Awareness Week. We have meds we talked about, RNAs, beta blockers, MRA and SGL2 inhibitors, devices, CRT, remote monitoring, implantable sensors, just got expand identification just a few days ago. Transcatheter uh, trans edge-edge repair, mitral regurg, we just talked about that. Don't forget iron deficiency anemia. 50% of patients, we didn't talk about that, have iron deficiency anemia. That's a simple thing you could screen, check a ferritin level, give them IV iron, that can make a big difference in our patients' lives. And then obviously the end of the spectrum when patients have progressive heart failure, they will need an, either an elevator or heart transplant. One last thing, uh, obviously I had 20 minutes to talk about a huge subject, right? And um, so you can tell I'm very passionate about this field. And, you know, last year we did our first dead gate heart first symposium. We're having one in, in a month and it's here in Sacramento. Everyone, if anyone's nearby, feel free to come down. It's on March 19th at the high in Sacramento. It's all dedicated to heart failure. It's a half day conference. Unfortunately, we don't have a, um, a virtual component too. I, I've heard a lot of feedback and hopefully next year we'll probably do a hybrid of both in person and virtual, but uh Hopefully to hope, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that we're able to see many of you next year. Uh, well, number one, thank you. Fascinating, really excellent, and just a, a, a new world for of those of us who have been doing this for a while. It, it's obviously a, a, a new world and an exciting world. Um, we have several questions and comments. And so uh, I want to just reintroduce Dr. Faluji. And um, uh, I forgot to mention that Dr. McGinn has... Uh, uh, is out of town today. And so that's why he's not on our call. So our panel will be myself and um, Dr. Faluji uh, and Dr. John Muhammad. And so um, there's a couple of comments in the, in the Q&A and then there are some questions in the chat. And so uh, the, the first one is to um, uh, uh, from Mike Carter to assist in increasing access. Is your team use, utilizing PAs or NPs for inpatient office or telemedicine? Yeah, very excellent question. So I'll start with inpatient piece. We didn't talk about that, but that's really a great time to, uh, to actually initiate these therapies, right? So patients come in the hospital for, let's say, half for instance, right? We have three goals. Obviously, what we've been doing all the time is decongestion with diuretics, but it's not as simple as that. First, we have to figure out, are there any educational opportunities? Let's say, did the patient run out of their diuretics? Did they not know about weighing themselves? What was the trigger for the hospitalization? Start with education. And then the third thing, you know, at our hospital, we're very fortunate. We have pharmacists, transition care pharmacists, right? Initiate that most of us have these medications on formally, but most of our hesitations is that will they continue the outpatient setting? So what I do basically is that I try to optimize as much of the four therapies as I can. I walk over right away to my transition care pharmacist. They're amazing. I, I think every hospital should have them. And they start working on any prior authorizations or able to continue that. I'm actually on a length of uh, a length of state committee for heart failure. And, you know, I said, we need to change our approach, how we look at this condition. We've been focusing on, you know, phone calls after they leave the hospital and that's fine, but that's not good enough. What we need to do is implement these therapies because that's been shown to reduce hospitalizations. And that's how a pharmacist comes in really quickly for the outpatient setting. Yes, I use, I have amazing four nurse practitioners and they're working very closely with me to up titrate these medications. Great. And there's another, um, and you've sort of touched on this, uh, from Dr. Sagar, great, um, great talk. Um, SGL uh, T2s and ARNI ARNIs are effective meds, especially for multiple protection mechanism. I often hear about concerns about access and cost. What should clinicians know about how patients can access these meds and the cost concerns? Yeah, so uh, so all these uh, therapies do have uh, coupons where you get them started right away for usually about thirty day coupon. Um, I will say that, for instance, on Tresto. Um, it's been out since, you know, now 2014. So now I'm definitely seeing much more payers be on board, especially since the guidelines are now, or consensus documents should say, are now saying it's a first line therapy. So more payers are, are uh, uh, covering it. Uh, for some patients that do not, uh, cannot get access, Entresto does have a very good assistance program they can apply for. And 
I think they can make up to 80,000 per year, which is, I think is pretty good uh, and still get uh, free medication from Novartis. So that's number one. And then uh, as far as the STL2s, uh, they also have assistance program as well too. And so I work very closely with the different reps and just know what the resources are. So, but it can be challenging. I'm not going to lie, but uh, they're definitely getting much better for sure. Uh, great. Dr. Faluzzi, questions or comments? Well, um, first, a great talk, Dr. John Mohammed. I've learned a lot. Um, I had a, a question to ask you about spironolactone and, and preserved left ventricular systolic function. Um, and I, as you have mentioned, uh, Jardians, I'm mentioning that name because it's easier to remember than empagliflozin, oh, yeah. but um, it could be expensive, but spironolactone clearly work and that's a cheap medicine. And historically we've used it at 12.5 to 25 once a day. Mm -hmm. Is, does that remain your practice or do you push the dose? Uh, yeah. So generally I try to just go, I usually 25, 25 milligrams is the max dose. That's the max the top cat. Yeah. And I actually do, I do spironolactone first. It's a cheap old drug, so cheap right. diuretics and you spironolactone. And then I've been doing Empala as my next one, you know, and then sometimes and cardiomems has been very helpful in this population. So right. as you know, it's very challenging to treat these patients because you diarrhea them too much, your cranium goes up. It's yep. kind of a narrow that's window. The challenge. Yeah. So that's been very helpful as well too. And let me ask you one more question. Um, um, how do you up titrate? And, and that's a, a, a challenge for us. We don't have heart failure specialists. Yeah. So we, yeah. you know, um, if you may want to touch base on sure. in, the, in, the, in the reduced ejection fraction group yeah. with, the, with the quads. Yeah, no, thank you for asking that question. It's a really great question actually. And the question I get often. So before we used to always, you know, how do we do? We would push up one class of drugs, push up the beta blockers, the max dose, let's say Carvalho 25 twice a day. And then you go to the A's, you know, and they go to MRAs. We found that that's not the way to approach it now. Initiate quad therapy quickly, right? Relatively fast on the lowest dose. So try to get them as quickly as you can. And then you can titrate up depending on what's going on. Let's say if their heart rate's high, let's say above 70, you can push the beta blockers in the fall, but start relatively all four relatively quickly. Am I starting four at the same time? No, but I mean, it's like you're starting maybe one, one, one week. I saw a patient just last week, yesterday for new onset heart failure that was on an ACE uh, in a beta blocker. So two out of four. So I switched him to Entresto this week. I said, next week, you'll be on an MRA. So then when I see him back in three weeks, they're already on three out of four. And then I'm going to do the fourth one then. So he says relatively quickly, and then you start fine-tuning. A great question. Uh, when you mentioned mitral valve clips, and what percent would you say of uh, surgical repairs for mitral valve uh, regurgitation have gone away with mitral valve clips? Yeah, so I, I, let me just step in for one second. We don't do surgical repair for functional MR yeah. because the data is terrible. Um, the, the surgeons won't operate. These are these are normal valves, just as Dr. John Mohammed said. The annulus yeah. is dilated, and historically, surgery never worked there. Yeah, um, I have to say, it it pains me to say that, but properly treated patients with functional MR, yeah, the majority of them can bypass the need for a mitra clip, um, and in fact, we've shot ourselves in the foot, but for the benefit yeah. of the patient, we start them on Entresto, they come back and say, I feel great. And he, I think Dr. John Mohammed stated, mm -hmm. the heart gets remodeled um, mm -hmm. back to where it needed to be. And you don't need the device. Um, I think we use the device for patients who are maxed out on medicines. That's correct. Got, got all the other devices, the, bi, the biventricular yeah. synchronization. And they go to Walmart and say, when I walk the aisle, I'm still tight. So this is the type of patient. He, he, they've reached the maximum therapy. They still want to do more. We want them to do more. Yeah. So we're not treating the MR, like he said. We don't treat numbers. We treat patients. And if the patient says, look, I'm still very short of breath. I really think I could do more. But I, that's when the mitra clip actually works. Yeah, yeah. Very, um, very, very good point. I, I think that sometimes... You know, in cardiology, we, we love our little toys, we love our procedures and stuff like that, you know, but we can't forget the basics, right? And sometimes that's why heart failure is not so sexy in cardiology, right? Because we just do simple meds, but these meds really work, you know, and, and, uh, and like, that's a very good point. And now even with the mitro MR, actually, it's mandated now, Dr. Fluge, that we were on part of the committee to come up with some guidelines that they need to see a heart failure specialist first. So my approach is I see a patient, I, I said, I got three months to do my work, right? And I use my nurse practitioners. And then we reassess their MR in three months. And then if their EF, I mean, so if the MR is still significant despite good meds, then we consider them for the mitral clip. And that's what was actually studied as well, too. Good point. Great. Uh, we've got some questions in the chat. I, this is just fascinating and, and uh, just an incredible conversation. Um, so the first one is, um, are you prescribing SGL2, SGLT2 inhibitors to all patients without diabetes and systemic heart failure? 
Uh, yes. Yep, for sure. So with and without diabetes. So the one without diabetes, it's easy. I prescribe it. I have no issues. Um, there's no issues about hypoglycemia for non-diabetics. Uh, the only side effect for these class of drugs is it can cause a urinary tract infection. It affects the pH balance. So they're more prone to developing what's fungal infections, about 3% in men and 5% in women. So I have no issues prescribing it for a non-diabetic. For mm -hmm. a diabetic, I have no issues unless they're on, if they're type 2 diabetic, if they're on insulin. If they're on insulin, then I will notify the primary said, would you like to make any adjustments in the insulin mm -hmm. or, or they're on complicated regimen? But uh, for the non-diabetics, prescribe it 10 milligrams once a day, it's simple, you're done. And there's no titration. That's the great part of that drug. It doesn't really affect blood pressure. It's renal protective, one dose, and you're done. So I'm using that pretty early on. Here's another one. Um, as you mentioned, so many of our patients have compromised uh, GFR renal function. If the, GF, if the GFR of 30, your lowest acceptable, or is GFR 30 your lowest acceptable level to commence spiral lactam? Do you ever start lower doses uh, due to hopeful cardiac benefit? Yeah, no, yeah. So, uh, no, not 30 for pretty much most of these therapies, it's 30 or above. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where does um, I'm going to not pronounce this correctly. Yeah. Vericulogot. Oh, <laughs> viruciguat. Yeah. Vir yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So vir viruciguat is a, a guanine cyclist inhibitor that was studied in the inpatient setting. So patients have been admitted for hef -ref, systolic heart failure, been admitted to the hospital um, and showing some benefit for recurrent hospitalizations. Uh, where it kind of fits in, it's not yet in our guidelines, but kind of, the way I kind of see it, it's kind of a niche drug, right? So you're going to first start with the four therapies. And uh, if patient, let's say, is admitted in the last year, then you can consider starting VO sigma maybe on top or maybe to replace some of the therapy. So it's going to be after all that. Just like hydralazine isosorbide, we talked about that. That was a study called in the AHEF study in the African Americans. I get that question a lot. Mm -hmm. When you start, that? let's say I'm seeing an African American patient, should you start that instead of some of the other four therapies? No, start the four therapies, even though there's a high risk of angioedema with African Americans with Entresto. You notify your patients, but you still do the quad therapy, and then that'll be next. I have a patient that I'm seeing that's on quad therapy, and they're still having some symptoms, and they asked appropriately so. They were doing their research. Can I be on that combination drugs? And I said, well, yes, you're on the four therapies. We can consider starting then. Okay. Here's another one. Um, a newly diagnosed a CHF patient, ejection fractured in 25%. How long do you wait on heart failure therapy before you decide on an ICD or mitral clip if MR yeah. exists? Yeah. Great question. Yeah. So uh, three months. Uh, so three months is what the guidelines are for, you know, for ICDs or CRTs, uh, pretty much as far as MR as well, too. Uh, I will say that uh, you need to have good conversation with your EP. So we're seeing now, you know, if you see the EF is going, for, let's say from 25, let's say to 30, I mean, you're almost at 35. And let's say you have some opportunity to increase medication. You can talk to the EP and particularly for some of the patients that have a lowest, uh, lower risk of arrhythmia, such as the non-ischemics, mm -hmm. I mean, hey, why don't we wait another three months, you know, or something like that, another two months. And so we have done that actually. And so, but three months is generally the rule. It will reassess in three months. Okay, fair enough. There's two more questions. Um, is it a priority of heart failure specialists in the current guidelines to get palliative care hospice involved early in these patients with advanced heart failure? Do you think this should be brought up early on? Excellent, excellent question. Yes, uh, absolutely. So part of the advanced heart failure evaluation is a kind of consultation to talk about the goals of care. Just just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? We ought, we ought, we we extend different options for patients. Some patients may not want that, and I think that we need to have more palliative care clinics in the outpatient setting for some of these patients as well too, and not just for half prep, half pep. PH, right? Mm -hmm. hypertension and other conditions too. Yes. And, uh, and Gary, I'll say that that's a great question. And, and I echo what Dr. John Mohammed said. We, we engage them early as well yes. with the structural piece. So we have them evaluate the patient because sometimes that's not the value that the patient seeks uh, in their care. So yes. uh, their role is expanding very quickly. There was one question about telehealth from um, other states. Can, can people con uh, from other states consult yeah. with Dr. John? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so technically based on, at least I know we've heard from our people here, you have to be licensed in the state that you're providing yes. telemedicine. So it can be only the state you practice in. Yes. All right. Well, I, I want to just say that, uh, first of all, I think we you have uh, gotten the record for the most questions. <laughs> and I think that is a marker of uh, the gravity and the excellence of, of this conversation. Uh, it's it's so innovative. It's so interesting to see um, how how um, 
hearts have been able to repair themselves as they go forward. That's just amazing. Um, so I just want to thank you. We will um, publish uh, the links to this talk. And um, uh, what we find is that um, uh, we, we, we have them on YouTube and we have them on other sites. Uh, we have uh, more than the number of people listen to them afterwards than we actually have attend. And so um, I would encourage uh, everyone on this call who have commented how uh, wonderful the talk was, and there are a lot, um, to encourage your colleagues, uh, because I think this is a great talk and, and really has been helpful for us. So I just want to thank both of you for your time, willingness, uh, stepping forward, and um, it's, I think it's just made for a great morning. So um, thank you very much, both of you. Thanks to all of our participants. I um, uh, hope people have a great weekend, a safe weekend. And um, we actually had slowed down a bit uh, on our um, uh, clinical updates and grand rounds, but um, uh, John and I have a whole stack of topics that we're going to get scheduled for the next few months. So thank you very much. And um, it's really been a great morning. So thank you. Thank you. Yep.